Well, welcome everyone to this uh, session on the role of Japan. Um, uh, I think it's a subject that needs more attention than, than it gets. There's a tendency, I think, sometimes because Japan is as quiet and as effective as it is in uh, regional cooperation and development and politics and trade leadership, that uh, there's a tendency, you know, when, when we look at news, I'm speaking and wearing my journalistic hat, we look for trouble and then we go there. Very often Japan moves unnoticed in that environment. So I would congratulate all our participants on having the wisdom to come to this important <laughs> session. Um, I believe the organizers would like me to remind you all that if you are using social media to communicate about this session, please use hashtag WEF24. You can mention my name too if you would like. <laughs> uh, and as we think about this uh, topic, it seems to me that um, we can think about Japan's role in a geopolitical uh, aspect where Japan, I think, is, is, is much more willing to engage and and discuss geopolitical issues than even in the fairly recent past. We can talk about its trade role, where Japan has taken a leadership role in the CPTPP, even after the US withdrew, working with Australia to make that uh, a reality. The political aspect of technology, friendshoring, a uh, digital aspect where Japan is really trying to work, and one of our guests here today has taken a major role in trying to improve the flow of information, which is clearly key to the future of trade. So if I can uh, introduce our, our panelists briefly, I won't trouble you with their biographies, which you can all find very easily. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing Masayuki Hiodo, who is the re uh, CEO of Sumitomo Corporation, uh, employs, I think, 80,000 people at 160 locations around the world. Um, the Minister for Digital Transformation of Japan, Kono Taro, is with us. Um, uh, Isabel Deschamps, who is the Chief Legal Officer at Rio Tento, and Michael Froman, who uh, is the President of the Council on Foreign Relations, an organization chiefly distinguished for having employed me for a number of years. Uh, that makes me your boss. Is that right? I think my former boss. I did a very important distinction there, which I'll explain to you later. <laughs> uh, so I guess what I'd uh, like to do to begin with is to ask uh, Minister Kona, how do you see the state of the world and Japan's place in it? All right, the world is increasingly fragmented. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainty uh, over what's going to happen over Taiwan Strait, what's going to happen to Ukraine, what's happening in the uh, Middle East. And the role of Japan is to bridge the different uh, groups like Japan is in a very unique position vis-a-vis -vis Middle East. Uh, we don't have the history of uh, colonialism in the Middle East. We are very uh, different uh, religion-wise. Uh, we don't have much of the Jewish-Muslim community in Japan, and we are very neutral. And when we say we can be an uh, honest broker, uh, I think people in the Arab world believe that. So Japan is in a unique position to make bridge uh, among those states. Or we have been working on like DFFT, data free flow with trust, to connect uh, GDPR of Europe, which is very tough on privacy, and the wild west of the United States. <laughs> Uh, they're not going to be, they're not going to have a convergence, but our DFFT could uh, increase the interoperability of, uh, of the world. So I think that Japan's role for the future is to make bridge in uh, different places. Yeah, with the economy accelerating movements toward uh, friend showering and supply chain resilience, that I think is, 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 has big implications for Japan and its role. How do you see Japan uh, being involved in these trends? Well, um, 
some time, some years ago, when we invited China to WTO, we thought China has a different political system. But if they become a good team player, everyone will get benefit. Unfortunately, it didn't work it out that way. So President Obama talked to Prime Minister Abe, let's make a new decision-making body for Indo-Pacific. And that was supposed to be TPP. So we pay some political cost in Japan. But we decided, the Prime Minister Abe took initiative to join TPP. And as we signed the TPP, unfortunately, President Trump left. So we want U.S. to uh, come back and uh, create TPP what is supposed to be. And uh, so that'll be our first step. And uh, I guess Mr. Froman could uh, work on it in Washington. So um, hopefully, uh, after COVID, the Japan's economy is changing. Now we say goodbye to zero interest rate. It's ticking up. Uh, wages going up. So if Japan could regain the economic power, I think we have a role to play. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yodo. Yes, sir. Uh, we've had a, the government view, or a yes. government's view. Um, <laughs> uh, how do you see the state of the world from the Sumitomo perspective? Well, yes. Let me try to put my answer to your question this way. L looking at the, the, the longer a period of time, a little bit. I think uh, definitely this time, uh, now, world itself is a turning point. Then my career in the company uh, for 40 years in the past has created a long-term relationship in the region. Of course, under the, uh, the foreign policy set by our government and also uh, partner countries. Then during this period, uh, Asia achieved trem tremendous, fantastic growth. And our relationship has changed from donor country to recipient country. But now, the partnerships among those Asian uh, community. Then during this period, private sector in Japan have extended our efforts to create the trust and the long-term relationship, having our value chain uh, scattered into this uh, whole region and to create the growing together concept. I think we are in good shape having this uh, long-term relationship at this moment. Then now it is our task further to enhance this relationship so as to meet the global demand and consensus reached in the previous uh, COP28, I think there are many things we can do together. So that's what uh, I look at the situation now. Mm -hmm. When I think of the consequences of friend shoring and other changes that we're seeing, yeah. it would seem to suggest an intensification of the relationship of Japanese business with uh, many of your uh, partner countries in the region, is that? Yeah, in a sense, yes. But uh, on the other hand, I think we have to be creative enough <coughs> to redesign the whole uh, value chain of mm. the industries in the region so as to make each value chain competitive enough and suitable for the new era where we have carbon neutral uh, issue needs to be solved. So. We need to be very creative for this. Collaboration is a key. I think we have the foundation built up during the last uh, uh, history of the relationship. Mm. I think this is very, very fundamentally important and strong uh, basis platform we have. Yes, so it's long-term business to business and people yes. to people relationships that you see Sorry. as the key. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, Ms. Deschamps. Uh, how do you see the world? You're, you don't represent a Japanese company or the Japanese government, but you're very active, Rio Tinto, in the region where Japan is a major player. How do you see the state of the world? Absolutely, and, and, and I think the view is, is for, from, for Rio Tinto, we've been working in partnership with Japan and Japanese companies for 100 years. Mm. Um, so 
initially a European company, then we uh, globalized and went uh, uh, more, much more global. But actually, the partnerships with Japan's and Japanese companies have been in all the, 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 the supply chains. So from selling, from investing, uh, having investors and uh, Japanese investors, mm. for having now a lot of partnerships in decarbonization uh, with customers. So there's a long history. So the view of the world is formed through that lens of this long history, long-term uh, view. Uh, on our side, the, the view of the world is very much that we're living in a, in a very fragmented world and in the world of uh, metals and, and, and minerals. And, uh, and this fragmented world is, is actually, um, we're, we're very sensitive to it in all the countries where we operate. Um, we see the demand for uh, materials and, and minerals increasing uh, dramatically. Um, because of the energy transitions and, and what we need to do for the mm. energy transition. Mm. And at the same time, when we look at it, the markets are very fragmented. So the, the, where the commodities are, where the, 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 the mining in the, uh, is in, in different countries from where uh, the processing is today, yes. very different to where the manufacturing is today and where the consumers are, so the end uh, customer mm. are. Right. So we're having to adapt to this new reality of that fragmentation in that chain. Um, and we see that this is the, the, the way and the, the place where the partnerships and the corporations with governments, private to public, is essential yeah. mm. as well to navigate this new reality. So we see that based on this long uh, history of 100 years of working with Japan and Japanese companies, we can actually build on that trust, mm. work on the long-term uh, resilience of uh, supply chain and, and, and looking at the world through that, through that lens. I suppose some people would look at Rio Tinto and say information is less important to a metals and raw materials uh, company, but I would imagine that the fragmentation of the global digital landscape and information landscape is a problem. Do you find the work that Japan is doing to try to free up the flow of information, is that an important thing for your business? That's absolutely critical for our business as well. So if we look at it from a lens of what we're trying to do from an ESG and the climate change, the decarbonization of the world, the data and the digitization is, is playing a key role uh, in that space, uh, all the way through uh, uh, working with governments and creating these uh, these strong relationships with the government. So that work is essential and we're, it, you know, data uh, builds also uh, um, transparency uh, and goes into the trust as well. So I think we can really see the links there and, uh, and the work that is being done in Japan and that space is, is very, very strong. Thanks. Well, Michael, you're, uh, you sit at a very interesting spot because the Council on Foreign Relations uh, is a kind of an interface between the American civil society and the world and, and, and the many forces in American civil society are represented in the Council one way or another. Uh, that's a very interesting spot to sit in, maybe particularly <laughs> this year. Uh, how do you see the world? Well, first, I think, uh, as many have said, it seems to be particularly heading towards greater fragmentation. I think the good news is we seem to be heading towards an economic soft landing, but the risk is we may be heading towards a geopolitical hard landing. Mm. And how that plays out will depend a lot on what happens in Asia, where half the world's GDP growth, half the world's innovation, patents, um, uh, half the world's growth in trade all comes from the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And how that plays out will depend a lot on, on Japanese leadership. But I think it's important to take a step back and think about how remarkable it is we're having this conversation. Because if we turn the clock back to the late 80s, when I first started getting involved in trade and I first went to mm -hmm. Japan, uh, uh, at that point, the concern was that Japan was a rule breaker. Mm -hmm. Then it became a rule taker and now it's a rule maker. And to see the transformation mm, of Japan mm. to that role, not just in trade, where it's absolutely evident, as you noted, as the US pulled out of, of TPP, uh, Japan really stepped forward with the other partners, but particularly Japan, to help keep CPTPP very much alive and, and expanding. Um, on the digital side, as Minister Kono is leading, uh, and the, the new work on data and data flows with trust, uh, Japan is clearly a, a thought leader on AI and the Hiroshima principles on AI, uh, very much a leader. Japan, in some ways, was, was ahead of the curve 
in being the first victim of economic coercion from China when mm -hmm. they cut off the rare earth uh, minerals in, in 2010 and led an effort, again, that, that culminated in Hiroshima uh, at the G7 on economic coercion and having cooperation among the G7 to prepare and deal with uh, incidents of that. So throughout this process, and really since Prime Minister Abe and beyond, uh, Japan has really stepped up in a very significant way, regionally and globally. And I think we very much, as a, from the United States perspective, uh, welcome that partnership and find that we are increasingly aligned, whether it's on the trilateral work with, with Korea um, or uh, the, the Quad work with Australia and uh, India or IPEF or any of these other initiatives where we can work together. I do think it's extraordinary how, how Japan's presence in all of these organizations has become so critical to their success, even even to their existence. Um, what do you think are the chances that the United States will again get involved, or join CPTPP, or in, in some other way uh, play, a, play a leadership role in trade in the Pacific? Like, I, I'm not holding my breath on CP, uh, CPTPP, but I, uh, uh, I watch with great interest as the UK recently joined, mm -hmm. as a number of other countries are in the queue. Uh, to join and how the countries involved are continuing to evolve that as a high standard agreement in uh, uh, in the broader uh, region. I do think the U.S. is trying to figure out within the constraints of its politics and the politics of trade have shifted significantly of how to in, uh, maintain its engagement and its leadership in the region. The U.S. is a Pacific nation and in many respects the, the future of the U.S. depends on what happens uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. And so whether it's IPEF or AUKUS or the Quad or the trilateral work, uh, I think we're all looking to find ways where the U.S. can engage in an ongoing basis that works for our politics as well. The issue of the United States is it used to be the only policeman of the globe. So they can do anything they want and we sort of let U.S. do that. But now in this fragmented multipolar world, I think U.S. is still leading the West. Uh, U.S. is probably the most powerful nation, but our United States need to play according to the rules. U.S. need to be part of the international system. Mm. But uh, if you look at the United States, it's not a part of UNCLOS. It's not part of ICC. It's not signing up a lot of weapons conventions. And it left uh, TPP. It once gone out of Paris Treaty, now it's back. So we need to encourage the US administration to seriously talk to the Senate that they need <laughs> to be part of all the treaties. They need to be part of the international system and be influential in the international system. When we talk to many countries about China breaking rules, China uh, using rough power for economic coercion, we often hear, what about the United States? Mm -hmm. So US need to be part of the international system, play according to the rule. And we, will, we are allies and we work wow. with the United States. But when we talk to the administration, they say, oh, our Senate. So it's time the administration really need to talk to the Senate. And in order to lead the world, uh, United States need to be a player. They cannot you know, stay out of the field and say something. They need to come and play a leading role. I'm happy to make this about the United States, but I think this is a, a panel about Japan. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, uh, all, all, all I would say is I think uh, we need to, uh, as democracies, yeah. understand where our yeah. publics are and bring them along so we have a sustainable policy going forward. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's not the way to do it. Um, well, but, Mr. But, Walter, may I say something? Yes, please. From do. private sector viewpoint, I think this discussion is very interesting, but that is the reason why we, Japanese industries, together with governments, two governments, very important, United States, Japan, can play a student government role to establish and enhance in the region where very soon more than 50% GDP on the globe will come out. 
So I think, uh, uh, of course, we would like to see, as Mr. Kono described, the relationship, United States and the globe. But uh, due to many reasons, it's not so easy, I understand. So on the other hand, pri public-private partnership can go on mm. based on all the discussions taking place now. Mm. There's no perfect solution or delivery, but I think we should be, private sector should be creative enough to come up with a good business model working together in the region. Mm. And I would totally echo this. And I think on board, we have to leave the, the politics and the, <laughs> and the government <laughs> issues to the governments, but we can definitely, the private sector can work in partnerships sure. uh, together with, with uh, the public sector. I think building in our, in our case a lot, the, the resilience in the supply chain, focusing on what are the, the, the requirements and the, of the countries and, and, and ensuring their you know, the critical minerals. We've been engaging a lot with uh, Japan, uh, also at the G7, uh, to, to focus on critical minerals and that, the, the security and the, and the supply chain, which is very welcome. So we've been very honored actually to be invited sure. at the G7 sure. to, to participate mm -hmm. in right. those discussions because right. this is where the partnership start when uh, with the, pu the public sector and the private sector. Yes. Well, it, how, um, how critical to your business is the failure, say, of U.S. political institutions to get involved in CPTPP? Is, it, is, it, is this mostly something that politicians think about, or is it a real factor for business? You can be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's much better for us to have a concrete uh, consensus mm -hmm. yeah. as among many countries as possible. But that is not reality. So within the framework described by polit um, politicians or uh, political uh, public side, we have to play our role. Yeah. That's. Mm. Yeah. That way, we, we play our own business field, right? So uh, we cannot get uh, in our hand what we cannot, uh, we should have, but I think uh, we can keep on asking the regulators, this is what we need to do to achieve the goal, mm -hmm. commonly shared by stakeholders in the region. Mm. Then through the discussion, uh, understanding, creating the understanding, I think we should be able to overcome any difficulties. You know, one uh, thing that, that has struck me historically about Japan's role in the world is this role of a bridge, that it was the first, quote, non-Western country mm -hmm. to fully embrace and achieve the kind of industrial revolution and mm -hmm. transition <laughs> into that kind of modernity. And ever since then, Japan has had a unique role between Asia and the West, but also, I think, between the global north and south. How does that historic rooting of Japan as a bridge, how does that play out in today's world where north, south, and west versus the rest issues are coming to the fore? Well, as the economy of the world sort of spread out, the role that our global south play is getting much, much bigger. And Japan is the only country in, say, G7 that don't represent Western civilization. So when I was a foreign minister, we had a big discussion of, among the G7. How are we going to deal with Myanmar? And uh, mm. the rest of the G7 wants to bring United Nations into Myanmar to see what's going on. But uh, for the people, the Buddhist people in Myanmar, the United Nations is a villain. Mm. They always side with other, you know, yeah. people. So Japan said, all right, let's not bring the UN into Myanmar. Let's have an independent team to go in and see. And we got an agreement. Oh, well, because of the coup, it's thrown out of the window. But uh, Japan's role in G7 is to represent non-Western civilization, non-Western economy uh, in the forum. And that's where we come in with DFFT. 
mm -hmm. the Europe with privacy, GDPR, the Wild West in the United States. And uh, if that goes to the different way, the data is not going to flow among the economies. Yep. And some people say data is uh, oil in the economy today. I think, or, I mean, I, I think the data is more of a soil to mm. build uh, things upon. So Prime Minister Abe took initiative to uh, propose DFFT. We don't talk about everyone's rule. We honor everyone's rule and regulation. But w even with different system, we need to increase the interoperability. Mm. And that's what we are trying to do with DFFT. And finally, we got the G7 agreed. We got an OECD agreed to set up a uh, new international framework under the umbrella of OECD. Now we are reaching out to the global south. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a new forum to discuss data governance. And a lot of countries are interested in and uh, I'm very hopeful many countries will participate in this forum to discuss data governance and actually try to implement a measure to increase uh, interoperability. So that's the role we're going to play. Uh, you know, we are joining G7, but uh, our roots are here in Asia and in non-Western civilization. And our role is to represent us in G7 or even G20. Mm. Mike. Walter, I think, uh, as Minister Kono just laid out, it's a, a very uh, articulate argument of why J Japanese leadership is so important and so valuable and how effective it can be in being a bridge, as you say, between East and West and, and between North and South. I think looking ahead, I think uh, uh, some of the good news is uh, Japan's economy right now, compared to much of the rest of the industrialized world, is actually doing pretty well. Um, to continue on that path, of course, it needs to be continued reforms, and there's a, a robust reform agenda uh, that Japan is pursuing. Longer term, I think the demographics are the biggest challenge mm. that Japan faces. And when you look to anticipating 21, the year 2100 and Japan perhaps being half the size <laughs> that it is now, right. uh, mm. it is all the more important that it gets its economic house in order and deals with some very difficult issues, issues that have been historically difficult mm -hmm. about women in the workforce, about immigration, and thinking through how is Japan going to retain that leadership position when it is a population of 50 or 60 million rather than right. what it is today. And perhaps fortunately for Japan, we're seeing a number of other countries in the region embracing Indeed. its demographic path, and uh, somewhat to the chagrin sometimes of their leadership. Yep. But this, I think, yeah, this transformation of maybe the global population from you know, increase, population explosion to population implosion is hanging over us all. But one other thing, I, in terms of the Japan's Global South relationship, it strikes me that the Japan-India relationship is something that many observers of world politics don't pay enough attention to. Mm. And that the sort of, when you go to Japan, you hear very warm feelings and you hear a lot of people who cooperate extensively economically in other ways with India. The same in India about Japan. How do you see this relationship? And is it in the business world a reality? May I? Yes. Yeah. In short, it's a great relationship created between two countries, uh, especially the current uh, leadership. And also, I think, uh, atmosphere between two uh, economics and uh, industries relationship is so um, uh, helpful for any uh, business uh, droppers from Japan can create further uh, enhancement. Like uh, there's a, a very a prominent example of Japanese industry uh, that became successful in the past decades, Suzuki Motor mm. Manufacturing. And even they are now planning to export EV manufactured in India to the world. Mm. So this type of uh, uh, actions or activities have not been imagined by anybody, say, 20 years ago or 30 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. But as I said at the beginning, due to this uh, long-term 
uh, efforts extended by Japanese industry. This new relationship and value chain is now scattered in the region. And as you pointed out, Japan demography is going to be a social issue of Japan. But from the viewpoint of global industry, Japan created. Many people say lost 30 years in the past, but I don't think so. From the viewpoint of private sector, mm. we have expanded mm. the business operation on the global basis, not sticking to Japanese domestic market. So based on this uh, framework, I think Japan, together with the government and policymakers, can play a very important role further to enhance creating joint growing together. Huh. This is very, very important. Mm. Does anyone in the audience want to ask uh, our panelists, either one panelist or the panel in general, a question? Do we have one? Yes, back here. And please identify yourself. Thank you very much. Mohammed Al Ardi from uh, Investcorp. Uh, so, my question is about uh, energy and energy. really how Japan foresee the energy mix and, in particular, uh, the role of uh, nuclear in the energy security and, and carbon moving forward. Thank you. Anyone? Well, um, anyone can guess that Japan has not much natural resources. We have to import oil and gas and coal and uh, uranium. Uh, our strategy is to <coughs> go decarbonized anyway. So we would try to reduce the use of fossil fuel and try to use uh, try to maximize the use of existing nuclear power while we are try to bring in renewable especially we have a lot of solar now and uh, we are trying to bring in a lot of offshore wind and there are a lot of potential for geothermal i think mm. we are after indonesia and the united states the world number 3 potential for geothermal so we need to maximize the use of uh, renewable. Plus, uh, you know, those who have lived in Japan have experienced how cold it is in our house in the winter. <laughs> Installation is a major, major <laughs> issue. So we need to increase the efficiency. Uh, and we've got to do everything together to meet our target for mm -hmm. the Paris Agreement. And I would say that's another area where actually the cooperation in private sector is really quite important and to uh, you know, build, with the constraint in which Japan is living on the, on, on the energy, uh, work on innovation and, 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 and really look at, uh, at, at different solutions for the long term. So I think there's good partnership there as well on the energy side. Hmm. I have more questions. Yes, sir. I'm Yoshi Hori of Globus Japan. I have a question to my foreman. You mentioned about rule breaker to rule taker to rule maker. <laughs> I like that you know, comments. And I wonder what the US role will be in that. Is it going to be rule breaker or rule maker? <laughs> and what are the areas you think that Japan should take a leadership on? You mentioned about AI and trade. What else? And how can we collaborate with the US in terms of rule making? It role? On, sure. <laughs> well, first of all, I think uh, uh, I, I mentioned trade, uh, digital, of, of course, uh, the AI. Uh, principles. I'd also add infrastructure. Uh, the, the work that Japan did, again, uh, leading to the G7 on quality infrastructure principles uh, as we're all working together through various initiatives to, to invest in infrastructure uh, in, in the Global South. I think that's another area where uh, the U.S. and Japan can, can work very well together. Uh, look, I think uh, uh, I won't pick a fight with my friend Minister Kono here, but uh, 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 I think sometimes uh, leadership also means taking a step back and saying, uh, these rules aren't working, hmm. right? The rules that we've agreed to, uh, and I, I'm, I, I'll, I, the one I know best, of course, is the WTO, mm -hmm. but as Minister Kono suggested, there was a certain expectation of what would happen. Um, I think the thought was, over time, China would become more like us. I think instead, we have become more like China. <laughs> so we, uh, uh, <laughs> the, we used to criticize them for protectionism, for industrial policy, uh, uh, for restricting investment, um, having not seen them make progress towards a more open, liberal economic system, market-oriented system, I think we and now others have responded by saying we have to protect our, 
our national economies as well. Japan knows as well, of course. It was one of the original investors in industrial policy. That tension that we had in the 1980s and the early 1990s, mm. uh, the, the bashing of, of Japanese cars, the conflict over uh, export controls, uh, the original concern about the hollowing out of American manufacturing by an exporter to the United States who was playing by a different set of rules, that was Japan. Japan evolved, China took its place. And I think what's happened is over the years, the U.S. has said, okay, we need to relook at these rules, make sure that we're investing domestically to protect ourselves in critical areas of national security, including manufacturing, semiconductors and the like, and we're cooperating very well with, with Japan, and the Netherlands and others on, on export controls uh, mm. around semiconductors and semiconductor manufacturing uh, equipment. Uh, we need to make sure that we're at the cutting edge of the latest technologies. Technologies that can have dual use, both for military and for civilian purposes. So uh, again, AI being the, the most recent one, but I'm sure it'll be over quantum computing and synthetic biology and any number of other uh, uh, emerging, uh, emerging technologies. And we need to define new roles with coalitions of like-minded countries. And that's where, again, I think the US and Japan can work very well together right. to make sure that the new roles ensure that we are able to maintain that position going forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jack. Uh, Jane Harmon, uh, I, I think we should all salute Mike Froman for his <laughs> heroic effort to draft TPP and defend TPP, uh, <laughs> and sadly, uh, to be here when TPP was buried. Uh, it was a huge loss for the United States. Uh, I think, uh, looking at it now, the U.S. has a schizophrenic view of trade. There is an anti-trade wing in both political parties, which is preventing mm. things like IPEF from having any real teeth. Mm. But my question is, the defense relationship between Japan and the U.S. is growing, and Japan has changed its outlook on defense, and this is a very big deal uh, to the United States. Uh, defense involves trade, too, in case anyone missed it. Uh, there's a lot of defense stuff that has to be either positioned in Japan or built in Japan, plus bases, et cetera, and I'm asking whether the defense relationship could be a path to try to uh, warm up uh, the U.S.'s view of the importance of trade with Japan. Hmm. Interesting. Minister? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine was a uh, wake-up call for Asia. You know, things like that could happen. And mm -hmm. uh, tension over Taiwan Strait is more real with newly elected uh, Taiwan president. So <clears throat> Japan-U.S. alliance is you know, very important more than ever, but uh, U.S. alone uh, cannot police the world anymore. So we need to create uh, alliance of like-minded country in the Pacific uh, as well. It's, not only necessary for NATO, but some, we need some kind of international relationship in the Pacific. And yes, <coughs> Jin is right. Uh, defense involved in trade. Uh, you know, how much we are supporting Ukraine with weapon system, ammunition, uh, other issues. So we need to build robust industry uh, for defense mm -hmm. purpose, but uh, uh, it is very difficult for one nation to build everything. Yes. So relationship with other countries, we are now building fighter jet with UK and Italy, and we're doing a lot of things jointly with the United States. So hopefully US would see this relationship and uh, convince the Senate to go back to TPP. <laughs> 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 I certainly think it's easier to talk to the Senate about defense-related mm -hmm. um, needs, and this may be an interesting approach to begin to re-engage on trade matters. Michael? Can I flag one more issue of, about U.S. leadership in the region, and but also where the U.S. and Japan might cooperate with each other? And uh, it, it spurred on by Jane's comment about IPEF. Um, there's been a lot of conversation that how real is IPEF if it doesn't come with tariff reductions? You know, I think actually uh, tariffs are much less of an issue in global trade mm. than they used to be, thanks to generations of, of trade liberalization. And the average U.S. applied tariff is 3.5%. What the U.S. has, 
you know, I'll just compare it to Europe. I, I often say, U.S. innovates, Europe regulates. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think both are satisfied with that, uh, with that division of, of, of labor. But what the U.S. has, uh, uh, almost uniquely, and I say almost because I think Japan is the one country that, that comes close, is this uh, being a center of innovation, of research and development, of risk capital, of entrepreneurship, uh, of investment. And those elements are so much more powerful. And we haven't figured out a way in the United States of how to include those things in our trade policy mm -hmm. or our outward economic policy, because those are what other countries really want, is to be involved in our innovation, our R&D, um, our risk capital. I mean, nobody can just create Silicon Valley or Route 128 around Boston overnight. It's, it's a whole ecosystem that exists there. And the one other country that I see that has many of those attributes is Japan. And I think the U.S. and Japan figuring out together how to offer that to the global south as a very powerful alternative to the magnetic force of China and others, I think that would be a, a, a very interesting uh, next stage in the relationship. We have another question over here, yes. Thank you. Isabel Hartung, a wrestling commit. Um, I have a question. Um, at the very beginning, you mentioned that the Japanese economy, um, you know, has a slight signs of going up with, you know, like increased inflation with higher wages. And I was wondering, and, and you said this is, you know, like a prerequisite um, for being a strong partner uh, to having uh, to have a strong economy. Um, on the other hand side, I mean, we see um, basically uh, the pyramid of, you know, a lot of old people. Um, you know, stagnation for a long time. Of course, groundbreaking technology. And I'm just wondering, what are the pillars you see that help you to kind of, you know, it's like come up like a phoenix and be strong in economy again, to be a partner, um, to be even a stronger partner in this in this whole undertake. Um, <clears throat> well. We had a very good growing economy back in the 80s. Some people call it bubble and it burst. Um, the business community or private sector in Japan got burned because of this the bubble burst. And they've been very risk aversive and not investing enough. Or when they invest, they invest outside of Japan. But now the confidence of the business community is coming back, I feel. So they will continue to invest in new technologies. Whereas the Japanese government has been increasing spending to push up the economy, but uh, with the government deficit of this size, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna continue. So the role of leading economy is changing from the government to the private sector. Mm -hmm. So now the private sector uh, will invest in leading edge technologies or you know, many others to get the uh, economy going. So it used to be, when I was foreign minister, I'm the one who asked the countries of global, global South, is there anything we can do to help you? But since I became digital minister, I, al I always hear, is there anything we can do to help Japan digitalize? <laughs> Thank you very much. The table has turned 180 degrees. So now, from now on, I think it's business community who are investing in the global south. And as Mr. Froman said, maybe US, Japan together try to create an ecosystem in the global south so that everyone can benefit. So now the role is, the torch is changing the hand, right. I believe. We are now just about out of time. Uh, and to try to summarize this very complex uh, discussion will be quite difficult. But I think two, two themes did emerge for me. One is the theme of depth, depth of relationship, where Japan historically has these relationships, public and private, but also depth of reflection. How do we think more deeply about trade in a, as a way to solve problems? The other is cooperation that this really partnership, this is really a theme that, that all of our participants and all of the questioners came back to again and again. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to the distinguished panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.